Our next speaker is uh, Uri Malmud, and uh, he'll tell us about water around white dwarfs. Hey, thank you, Amri. So uh, the topic of the talk is white dwarf pollution, which I will explain what it means, uh, and also water retention and the prospect of habitability. So I just want to uh, start with a familiar example, which is our own sun. Our own sun is what we call a main sequence star, but in a few billion years, it's going to basically run out of hydrogen in its core. And at this point, uh, the envelope will expand, uh, it will cool down, it will grow in size, and it will become a red giant. After that, it would become an AGB star, and it would engulf all the inner planets, maybe except for Mars. So that's the fate that uh, we're, looking, uh, we're looking for, but it, it's going to happen in a few billion years from now. Uh, schematically, it looks like this. This is the orbit of Jupiter, Saturn, the asteroid belt, and the inner terrestrial planets. So the sun is going to become a red giant, uh, engulf the inner planets, except for maybe Mars. Uh, because it loses mass, primarily during the AGB phase, uh, by conservation of angular momentum, the orbits of all these planetesimals, they have to expand. And what happens next is um, <clears throat> after the stellar winds dissipate all of this envelope, we remain with just the core of the star, which is a degenerate core of carbon and oxygen. We call this a white dwarf. Initially, it's very hot, so it's white, so we call it a white dwarf. And if by any chance one of these planetesimals a comet, an asteroid, whatever you want to call it, is perturbed, injected into a very close orbit near the white dwarf. What's going to happen is that the tidal force is just going to rip it apart, okay? Uh, how does that look like? I'm, I'm actually also studying this uh, particular field. Uh, tidal disruptions can be partial, like you see here, or full, okay? So these are fully disrupted tidal streams that they can be gravitationally self-confined and collapse on themselves, like here, or not collapse on themselves. So that's a, like an interesting topic unto itself, but it's not gonna what I'm going to focus on today. Uh, what happens in short is that we form this eccentric debris disk, like you see here, and it actually in time evolves uh, into something that looks more like Saturn's rings, okay? So a compact central disk an accretion disk, and from this disk, uh, material is accreted onto the white dwarf atmospheres. Okay, so white dwarfs also have atmospheres. Uh, and this is great because we can use it. It's the only window we have currently to investigate, investigate the bulk composition of extrasolar systems. Uh, this is the first study for 2007, which had high resolution spectroscopy and you can see the various elements in this atmosphere. And from the relative abundance of all of these elements, you can infer what is the chemical composition of the object or objects that have polluted this white dwarf atmosphere. And uh, now, nowadays, we have dozens of these high uh, resolution spectroscopy cases. And it turns out most of them are dry. So the objects that accrete onto these white dwarfs, they're terrestrial-like, they're Earth-like, they don't have a lot of water in them. Uh, several years later, Jay Farihi in 2013 uh, found the first example of a white dwarf atmosphere that has a lot of oxygen, so much oxygen that it can't be explained only by rocky minerals, by metal oxides. Uh, there has to be excess of oxygen, which comes from H2O, from water. So this is a water-rich object that has accreted onto the atmosphere of this white dwarf. Uh, so that's great, but out of dozens of cases, we only have three examples of these uh, water-rich objects so far. Um, so like I said, these are rare, and most of the time the composition that we find in, in this system uh, are dry. And that's an interesting question, why is it dry. Um, in the solar system, in our solar system, we know there's, there's plenty of water uh, starting from the asteroid belt and of course the outer solar system, we have a lot of icy objects. Um, so what gives? Why, why, why is there so little water in, in white dwarfs? And 
Uh, the answer is it could be related to the fact that stars evolve. Okay, so the whole stars, as I started my talk, the whole stars becomes a red giant and then the AGB star. So it expands, it becomes very bright, very luminous. And so by irradiation from the star, insulation from the star, you can simply, it's easier to sublimate the water and lose the water. Uh, so is it actually happening? No one has really studied this in detail. So what I want to show you is a, is a study that actually looks at this phenomena in, in detail. And the answer is that it depends. It depends on a number of things. First of all, it depends on the mass of the host stars. Some stars are very massive. Others are more like our sun. Uh, and primarily, it depends on the properties of the minor planet themselves. So if, for example, you have a minor planet that's very far from the star, it's easier to retain the water. Uh, if it's larger, it's easier to retain the water. It also depends on uh, how fast this minor planet formed because minor planets that fo form very fast, uh, they have enough radiogenic heating to cause differentiation. Differentiation is the process in which you form this um, icy mantle overlying a, a, a rocky uh, core. And the reason it's important is because then it's easier to get rid of this water. It's closer to the surface. Also, it depends on the composition because then this, uh, this mantle is th thinner and so on. So all these parameters are... You yes. have four minutes. Okay. I, I hope I can do it in time. So what we do is we investigate this with a model that has, uh, that couples all the processes, the thermal, physical, chemical, mechanical, and orbital processes. Um, and I, I just want to show you how complex it is. Let's suppose we have a chunk of material that has ice and porosity and some rocks. So if you apply some heat, the ice can sublimate or melt. If it melts, it can react with the rock, what we call a serpentinization chemical reaction. So that changes the properties of the rock, the physical properties and also the thermal properties. So it changes the rock's density. Uh, if the rock density changes, the global size changes. If that changes, then the self-gravity, the pressure by self-gravity changes. And if you take as input the pressure and the composition, you put in an equation of state that determines your porosity. So if your porosity changes, it changes also the thermal coefficients, the permeability, which changes how heat is transported inside the object and also how mass is transported inside the object, how the gas flux is determined and how the liquid flux is determined and so on. So what I want to show by this is a really complicated set of equations that, that solves this thing uh, with all the constituent relations. And the only way to solve this is to put it in a computer and let the computer do the job. Uh, instead of talking about and showing the math, I just want to show you um, a video of one example of how it looks like. So this object uh, is a series analog. It has about the same radius of series and it's orbiting a sun-like star with the same mass of the sun, um, initially at three astronomical units, just like series. So these white pixels are ice. When they become uh, water or liquid water, they're blue. Um, the brown is rock. And when it becomes serpentinized, when it becomes hydrated, it becomes olive. When it becomes molten, it becomes red. And the pore space is just black, OK? So what you will see here first is differentiation um, of Sirius. And then I'm going to explain. You see how Sirius differentiates into an icy mantle overlying a rocky core. There is a portion of hydrated rocks here and internal portion of dehydrated rock. Uh, also compaction because the temperature and the pressure here is much larger, so the pore space uh, disappears. You saw a little bit of melting here in the middle. And now when this whole star reaches the RGB phase, the red giant phase, you see because the star becomes more luminous, all of the water sublimates from the outer portions and even baked a little bit during the AGB phase. So in a series of papers, we actually investigate thousands of different cases like this, different radii, different or initial orbits and so on and so forth, different stellar masses. And we calculate how much water is retained in all of these objects at the end of this evolution. Uh, it's important because we can show in which cases uh, water can be fully retained as a function of the different parameters or fully depleted and so on. 
Um, so there's a tool, if any one of you is interested in something like that, which everyone can freely download, you just put uh, any combination of all these parameters and you can see how much ice is retained and how much water is retained at the end of the evolution. It's related to habitability because if you have a planet that's very close to the white dwarf, uh, this planet can be habitable for billions of years. The problem is how you get a planet to go very close to a white dwarf because it obviously can't uh, form at this distance. So it has to circularize. And in this process, if it had any water to begin with, the water is gone. So our study is perhaps one way in which you can imagine how water gets to this planet if just by collisions with minor planets that, that harvest water, that have water, you can get this water uh, back to the planet and then you can have an habitable environment. That's it. Well, thank you very much.